yeah, yeah. Welcome to GPS. I am Jay Larock, and today we're going to be talking about a great turn-based strategy RPG called Legends of Eisenhower. And today we're happy to be with someone all the way, because we go all around the world to find the gamers and game makers that you like. We're going all the way to Russia, to Belarus, actually. And we're going to be talking today with Alexander Durge. Uh, thanks for uh, coming on and talking with us. Hey, thanks for having me. Now, did I get anything wrong in the pronunciations or anything? Because I know that sometimes no, I'm an issue with everything, everything is perfect. Ah, awesome, awesome. So, uh, first off, you know, with GPS, um, you know, it's kind of funny because, you know, we started off with just calling it Gamer mm-hmm. Profile Show because we like to profile gamers and get a little bit more about their background. But it also works out with GPS because we get to talk to so many people all over the world. I mean, I've, I've talked to people already in, in, in Russia and, and also in places like France, England, uh, Argentina, places like that. Can you tell us a little bit about, like, gamers and, like, gaming in general, you know, in your country? Well, you know, like in, um, I think like our country is famous for the world of tanks, you know, because in the same cities, the world of tanks is done. And actually, my sister is working there in the UX department. And also, for example, our art director, we lured him out of Wargaming to, to come to work in our team. Because I think Wargaming, like, you know, this place is great for people who... Um, I mean, for programmers, for all other stuff, but for art people, it might not be so fun because the only thing you get to draw is only tanks, you know, tanks and, and landscapes. So as a result, of it wasn't very, really, wasn't very really hard. So, and in, in gaming, in general, people here like like all kinds of stuff, you know, like mostly actually, uh, uh, like the games is developed here locally. A lot of people develop mobile games and they develop like social games and things like that, but. Uh, I think we are probably the most hardcore game in, in the entire country of Belarus right now. Maybe even in Russia, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> so what about your own uh, gaming background? What did you grow up playing? Well, um, my first game I played, I think, in 1988, and it was Arkanoid. It was like, you know, this like little thing where you kind of stuff. But then, like, after Arkanoid, like, we, we also played a little Pac-Man and stuff but but then we really got hooked on the strategies like there was a little game called empire it was like empire war game of the century like and there you could like you would you would get cities and cities could produce tanks like airplanes like destroyers cruisers submarines air carriers and then you know like it, it, it was also like turn-based you could play either with your friend like in a hot seat or you could play against the computer and was really fun. Like we, I spent a lot of hours. I think our longest match with a friend of mine lasted like thirty-six hours straight. So we just we played like day and night and another day, and I won. <laughs> Do you have like a favorite uh, game from back in the day, like a classic game, maybe even something that inspired uh, you when you got to creating this one? Well, you know, like back back then, I think Empire is probably like the, the games that I like the most there because uh, I mean. That's what we like. That's what we played. I think since, I think ninety two through ninety six, we played like you know almost exclusively that game. And we like I, at that time I was living actually in Germany, and I didn't know other games actually even existed. You know, it was like I was I, I didn't consider myself like a gamer. I just like one game, <laughs> and we, we we kept playing it like in the spare time you know, from my work and from my study. So, but later on when I um. Um, I really I, I started to get more into games like uh, you know that have a story, and to, like the games that really influenced us the most for creation like of Legend of Eisenwald is Disciples Two. Disciples Two is really uh, is, a, is a great game has like a great like but maybe too simple combat and has like really good story really good like setting and really good world and uh, I really enjoyed, enjoyed that game and since then I kind of got convert from strategies more to like, you know, RPG games because I really like, you know, the games that have a story that you could really dive into the world and, you know, and think. And for example, another recent favorite, like not so recent, but like, you know, six years ago, was King's Bounty. You know? ah. The remake of the original King's Bounty is a really great game. And also Heroes of Might and Magic, of course, but Heroes of Might and Magic 3, you know, that was the game that was played here the most. And um, 
why I like it, uh, you know, and I still have like really fond memories, but I still I would use it anytime. I would like Typos to I would prefer any time to Heroes of Might and Magic because uh, Typos to had a story. Heroes of Might and Magic series they didn't have, and uh, I still, while it was really fun, like mechanics wise, uh, it wasn't wasn't so much of a story. So. And what was the point uh, where you made that move to wanting to actually get into game creations? I was reading some of the other interviews, and you were talking about um, how you guys got together, how you met people that you've known for a long time. Can you tell us a little bit of that process that led you up uh, to creating the game and getting with the game company? Well, uh, the thing is, like, uh, once um, um, I haven't played like games like in a while, and then after like very long pause, I stumbled into games that was called Discord Times, and that was and that was a game, and I and actually I didn't even get this, like I didn't even buy that game for myself. I bought it for friends who wanted to have like a simple game that would run on a notebook, and that game was like 60 megabyte big, and it actually it stated it would run on any hardware. So I took that game and installed it on their computer. And they wanted to play, but they they didn't seem to like it very much. So, but uh, but in the process of me showing them the game, I started to really like it myself. So since since they didn't want it, I I uh, I, I installed it. I got the CD myself and started playing. And it's really like I think I uh, of almost two weeks I disappeared from the world. Like I was on vacation uh, at that time, and I just played that game like through, and I was like, whoa, it's it's really amazing. And then. Uh, um, I started to search, you know, like internet, the forums. I, I found, like, I found that developers were from my hometown. Like, I decided to talk to them and ask them, "Hey guys, when are you going to make a sequel? This is an amazing game." And I heard that well, they were not, they didn't have any particular plans. And then I thought, well, uh, to hell with that. We have to do something, something nice and something good about it because in my mind, that game only like it, it was. Moderately successful and if it's proper translation and it's proper maybe like some PR coverage, I think it would have, it would have been a real hit. Now, but um, it was popular in Russia and West. It was like English translation was really really bad. So, uh, <laughs> so and that's how we like we started talking. It was like way back in 2007. We started talking. Like it took us like almost two years, you know, to actually. Uh, come to decision to actually start making game. I managed to gather some funding in the process. And yeah, and then we started. Yeah, I was looking at the Kickstarter and you know it, it you know very successful Kickstarter and, and as, as as far as also uh, going towards your stretch goals and things like that. So that's really great. And um, you know looking over the game and reading uh, about it, you know, it does have that uh, flair for like the Almost the classic style of gameplay that a lot of games don't seem to do nowadays that you saw like on computers back in the '90s and stuff. Um, for people that don't know, can you take us a little bit through uh, Legends of the Eisenwald?
Well, Legends of Eisenwald is um, what I would call it. So, uh, some people call it strategy RPG, but I still think, like, even though, like, in, on PAX, we won an award, like, from a course.com for best strategy game, we don't really think our game is so much strategy, but it looks a little bit like strategy. Like, in a way, it's, a, I would call it a tactical RPG. It's an RPG with tactical battles. It's set in medieval Europe where superstition of that time became alive. So it's um, it's like we don't have like uh, mages throwing fireballs. We don't have really uh, we don't have really like orcs or elves or anyone. Or we don't have dragons. But we have the things that people of the time believed in. So we have some werewolves as well, like some undead. But they don't dominate the scenery. It's like it's more <laughs> realistic medieval time of like how people of the time believed it was. So with all the superstitions uh, becoming alive. And um, our combat is a kind of is a strange mix between uh, Disciples 2 and uh, Heroes of Might and Magic. So we, we took from Heroes of Might and Magic this like uh, hexagonal grid. And, uh, but from Disciples, we tried to keep this uh, game like tactical yet simple. Because for example, in a, in a normal game like King's Bounty or, or Heroes of Might and Magic, First, you have to run to the enemies and fight, and then like it's, it's taking too long. So we wanted to have a swift and, and tactical combat, and that's uh, and it's also it's, it's a story driven. It's a non-linear story um, that would like when the game is fully released, we expect to be at over 50 hours of gameplay. A campaign alone will take probably 40, 50, and then you have plus several extra scenarios. So if people way. haven't played those type of games before, is it something? that you would say is a little bit more difficult to pick up because from what I've been reading, you know, a lot of people who are into that type of gameplay said that, you know, it really hits that, that type of gameplay, the strategy, uh, the building of your armies, even uh, little things as, as far as configuring each player. Uh, but if you're brand new and you're just trying to get into this type of game, would you say it's going to be a little bit more difficult to pick up? Well, you know, like there are, uh, we, uh, like one of the mistakes that was done in Discord Times, which is the previous game, we did. Uh, that game was very difficult and it had only one uh, level of difficulty. In the present game, we made it actually like four levels. There is an easy, normal, difficult, and ultra difficult. So if a new person would select like an easy level, first of all, we have like a, a quick auto resolve combo. So our AI is good. And usually, if a person would play on, a, on an easy level, if they are really kind of have a difficulty winning a battle, they could press like this, you know, quick battle or F F3 key, and they would win it instantly. So, and it's like um, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be so challenging because like the later when they know more, they would learn all the different like things and stuff. Because actually, since it's like you only have one army, you you have one army, and in, in this army you would actually you would get your followers. You, you will get your troops, you can equip them individually, and when you equip them, you will start to see that, oh, this weapon will give him more attack, or this, for example, this shield will uh, give him like more defense, this helmet will give him more defense. So in the process, they will actually get to learn more, more how it works. But I would also say that it's actually, yes, this game is a little bit more difficult to begin than, you know, than other games. But still, like, for example, Pillars of Eternity right now is out, and it's it's very difficult. It doesn't stop people from playing. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> uh, there is, there is, there is definitely market for that. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the part? Because I was watching some of the gameplay where you can actually configure like the items. Because uh, you know you have some of these games where you just basically pick your guys. They have their set attributes, and then you send them in. Uh, how with this game, you actually can customize them much more, which I think is a really great aspect. Oh yes, yes. So it's that's the part that we really like. You know, we really like from from disciples, where it's like we we don't really have like uh, stacked units like in Heroes of Might and Magic. It's like one unit is one unit. So in in each unit you can uh, you can give him a helmet, you can give him a weapon, a shield if they can wear a shield, and then also um, armor. And the, then there are also like four items for different amulets or different things. This the characters can use, and there are also two. Spots for portions. For portions, it could be like a healing portion you could use during a combat by skipping a turn, or it's a, it's a characteristics modification portions that, for example, you skip a turn, but you get like, a, for example, I don't know, blessed weapon uh, bonus for the rest of your 
battle, for example, if you fight undead or if you fight ghosts, it would, it would be really helpful. So, uh, and all this, all this, uh, all the stats that you have, we basically have like uh, HP. We have like in, we have health. We have like uh, melee defense and attack, then ranged defense and attack, and we also have like uh, initiative and willpower. And willpower was a very interesting, I think, our design decision that is basically. If, you, if your character has a positive will power, then your healer will spend less less spiritual power, less mana on healing him. But for enemy, it will actually this uh, this delta of uh, of spiritual power of will power. It actually it will make enemy units less susceptible to all this sorcery and magic. So as a result, like each unit, it, it, for example, if you have like a damaging unit, you can customize it to have like really high attack. For example, the other unit you can customize it to be a tank and to have very high defense, but but then you also can uh, can customize units to have like a lot of uh, ritual powers of the, like it basically would be mages. But you also have church units that that could uh, use this uh, um, willpower uh, in combat because for church units the willpower is added on top of their the attack and defense. So as a result, like there is, there is a lot of customization going on, and you can play different things. I, I I've even seen like recently a let's play of, of people who were playing with peasants. Peasants usually yeah. like so they're really worthless. I mean, like characters, but people play with them and still manage to be there. So and they're definitely newcomers and still having fun. So. Yeah, that's the great thing. I was looking over the gameplay, and and I really like how <laughs> people can play so many different uh, uh, variations. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about the scenarios, like uh, different scenarios that you play in the game? Okay, well, um, in our game, we will have like one large campaign that will span eight chapters. And it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of, it's a big campaign, which, where it starts, like, it start, like right now in early access, we have three chapters, and then the five more will be added when the game is released. But then we also have like single, uh, single scenarios. Like there is like a scenario called the Masquerade. It's a story-driven like little scenario that was released as the very first in this game. And there is then there is a cursed castle, which is a kind of skirmish-like, you know, little story. A lot of combat, a lot of conquering castles and things. So it's um, also we already have like a few. Um, uh, modders who created their own scenarios and they are already uh, also available in the game. And uh, but it's it's still like our main campaign will be I think and it will be and it is the major draw because uh, our game is really designed to be story driven. So and the main campaign where you have multiple choices where you have like all these like different paths you can take and it's, it's and it's not that obvious a path. It's like you will make decisions and then you will find oh I got here because I did this. And in, in retrospect, it will be understandable, but in the process, like a lot of people, they don't realize because the world is big, it's huge. A lot of things are um, are going on, and it's not that simple. Nice, and and I also like the the artwork and and the music that goes along with it. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, um, the artwork we were very lucky to hire a, like a very good artist who did like a lot of. Um, he did all the sketches for the characters, pretty much, pretty much everything, and also like did like a kind of two D um, backgrounds, like for for buildings, for cities, for for like other locations, and then um, and the music we had like we were very lucky from the start because our composer she she is really into medieval things, and uh, uh, the soundtrack is really is really fitting. It's not like it's not epic, it's not bombastic, but it's really kind of it, it lets you to be immersed into this medieval atmosphere, to kind of to feel a little, little in the mood of this medieval times. And it's more, like it's more like um, many people compare our story to Sir Walter Scott, so Ivanhoe, like this, this like this chivalry, chivalry novels. So that's um, and it's actually it's it's uh, maybe it's it's a good thing to compare it like to a book because like the, the text is. There is really quite a bit of text in our game. Also, like in, in several other games, like like Pillars of Eternity, for example, the recent example. What do you think when like uh, like the um, overall of the reception and like when you see, like you said, seeing people playing the different Let's Play and stuff? Like, how do you guys take that in in, in with what you're doing? Uh, you know, adding to the game. 
Well, you know, like in the right now, actually, I'll be honest with you. Like right now, we'll just watch it for fun because, uh, like, we are at the stage where all the content is done, all the functionality is kind of locked, all the design is locked. So we mostly what we work on is polishing, on adding like some special effects, on adding sound effects because it's not fully done yet. But in the beginning, in the beginning, when we, we, we were watching how people play it, like it gave us a lot of information. It gave us like, oh, this maybe is not really thought through. Like for example, like our interface, like many people like were really concerned about the interface because it looked kind of bulky and like a little darker. So we redesigned it. And then also our tutorial was not the best. So we also went ahead and redesigned it so to make it more accessible. So. Um, Right now, Let's Plays are a really good source for uh, seeing, like, for example, some bugs. If, like, if people, like, if they, if they have it already on screen, you don't need to reproduce it. You can just record it and say, okay, now there is a proof, there is a bug here. So, but it's, it's getting less and less of them, and I'm, and I'm hoping by the release we won't have too many, many of this in the game. So, right now, you can check this out on Steam, correct? Yes, it is. It is right now out on Steam. We also have it, like, in, in most of the other smaller stores like uh, uh, like Zura, Gamers Gate, whatever. I mean, it's it's pretty much rare, but uh, most like pretty much all of them they sell Steam keys, so it's a good one. Steam. And when are you looking forward to as far as uh, final release? Final well, release will be in a few months. Like the few last checks, what I have to do because we also we will have uh, a retail version in, in Europe and maybe in Russia. Of the game, so um, I have to talk to like two different teams for doing this retail versions of the game and coordinate with them the release date. And then once you kind of lock it there, like I also need to check with all the localization teams and to make sure that like you know they're on time and on schedule because we already have like English and Russian is translated and done, but we also will have German, English, French. Uh, uh, we'll have German, French, uh, Spanish, and. Belarusian. So um, this Belarusian is also, I think, will be taken care of. But these three languages, like I just have to make sure they will translate the game on time, and they're all on schedule. And once it's all set, we it's also we'll have to arrange it somehow because it's just it's not just good. Like oh, we just gonna announce the game, and then you know it's like, we'll, we'll do a proper maybe like press release. We'll release I think a cinematic trailer to that, and uh, yeah, uh, and we'll move. The next phase. The game is Legends of Eisenwald, and you can check it out right now on Steam. Uh, but I want to thank you, uh, Alexander, for coming and talking with us today. It was uh, very great to hear about the game, and we look forward to checking it out. Okay, okay. thank you. Thanks for having me and for interest in our game. All right, we'll be back very soon with another episode of GPS, the Game of Profile So, brought to you by Obsolete Gamer. I'm Jayla Rock, but until next time, remember our motto never stop gaming.